It all starts with a definition. Definitions are language constructs that we use in order to encapsulate some part of reality. And <clears throat> if enough people buy into the definition, then by definition it becomes reality because we all believe that way. It's like uh, I always ask people, why is uh, the current president the president? Okay, well, it's primarily because we all think he is. Okay, why is the U.S. dollar worth anything at all? Does, does this make any sense to you? I mean, you work for two weeks and they give you this stack of paper and say, go for it, you know? I mean, thank you very fucking much, you know, because you could have something of value. Well, they give you something that everyone believes has value. It's a, it's a unit of exchange, is what they call it. And so as long as everyone believes in the value of the dollar, <clears throat> the dollar is strong. As long as overseas investors think that the dollar is strong, the dollar is strong. Definition is everything. So how might we define hypnosis? I have one, and I have one that works pretty well. But I'm curious, what, what did you walk in here understanding hypnosis to be? What is hypnosis? Language. Language? So language is in itself hypnosis. How we use it. Rationalize the thoughts of others and yourself by using that. Okay. Who else? Buddy. I'm stealing someone's definition, but it's like any effective form of communication. Any effective form of communication? What else? Anybody else? The state of mind when you're conscious is not as, when you're unconscious is more susceptible to suggestion. <laughs> Spelling errors. I would say where this, the unconscious is more suggestible? Yeah. Anybody else? No, it's a state where disbelief is suspended. And you're cheating. We were staying outside talking about this before the class. Disbelief is suspended. Anybody else? It's a hyper focus. Sorry? It's a hyper focus. Okay. Anybody else? Almost as many answers as we have students. <clears throat> the influence of, of others um, through the, uh, I think through the, well, I guess that would be more like what's on top there, through the use of language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but influence, others. I think that definitely is something that's. Influencing. Okay. I'm going to give you mine, <clears throat> which actually encompasses about half of this. <clears throat> Hypnosis is suspension of the critical factor combined with establishment of acceptable selective thinking. And you should write this down. Suspension of the critical factor means for that moment in time, for whatever reason, you are no longer making judgments. There is a part of your mind that is tasked with making a continual stream of judgments. Good, bad, hot, cold, familiar, unfamiliar, right? Now, when you allow that part to not go away, not stop, not, not cease to be, but rather just suspend its activity, no longer make judgments, that means you uncritically accept what follows thereafter. Now, have you ever experienced this before? 
How many of you have ever been to a movie? Right? <clears throat> now, you're sitting there, and it's a movie you wanted to see, obviously. So you're sitting there, and you're kind of anticipating it, and the crowd files in, the smell of popcorn fills the air. Okay, and then the lights go down, the screen lights up, and for the next hour and a half or so, you have suspended critical thinking. Okay? You're not sitting there going, Tom Cruise got $20 million to do this? <laughs> you know? Or, like I always do, <clears throat> we're, we're sitting in, I mean, I'll use that example, sitting in Mission Impossible 2, and they're going through all the stunts. And I'm sitting there next to Cassidy going, you can't do that. No, that's not how it's done. <laughs> okay, real pros don't do that. No, 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 that's not how the fight goes. I mean, it's like, <clears throat> You know, if I would just shut the fuck up, suspend critical factor, you get with the movie because you're there for an experience to enjoy the movie, to suspend reality, suspend disbelief, and just get into this fantasy for a little while. Right? Getting into a movie. Think about it. You're sitting there in a darkened room with 300 people you don't know, probably wouldn't associate with, okay? And yet they all just disappear. Unless somebody's kicking your seat or coughing or something, you don't pay any attention to that. Even though what you're doing is sitting in a room with 300 people. That's the actual activity. And you're, but instead, you're off somewhere else entirely. Okay? So the first step is to suspend the critical factor. Now I'm going to do some diagrams of how the mind works, and you'll find out what the critical factor is and why we call it that. But you're essentially saying for this moment in time, you're just going to suspend disbelief, making no judgments whatsoever, uncritically accept whatever happens next. <laughs> Sound appealing if you're setting out to influence someone? Yes. Okay. The second part is establishment of acceptable selective thinking. Okay, now look at the parts of that phrase. Establishment is easy, but acceptable means you can't be violating any major taboos. Okay, people always ask me, can you make people do things against their will? I say, no, I can only make them do anything I want. <laughs> okay? Both are true. Because the thing is, if I were to take someone, if I were to take young Bucky here, okay, drop him down into trance, hand him a gun, and say, no, nah, I want you to shoot Nick. Okay? Even though he was a profound trance subject and he was just way lost in trance, he'd pop right out of it and he would not, in fact, shoot Nick. This should be a reassuring thing. Okay? Why? Because it violates very deeply held belief systems. We would hold. It just won't work. No, no, it's been tested extensively. No, no, we would hold. It's a... It's a, it's a right. <coughs> right. If you try this, that, that is the caveat. Thank you very much. If you try this with a contract killer, okay, because it's not a real stretch for him, we have a dead Nick. Okay? But... We do not believe things in isolation. We do not understand things in and of themselves. We only accept things as true within context. Right? That's why vacations are so cool. Right? When you go on vacation, you don't have to be the same guy you were back at home at work. It's kind of the whole point. Right? If you could go on vacation at work, nobody would go on vacation. Right? It doesn't make any sense. We go on vacation in order to allow ourselves to act, think, feel differently than normal. We change the context. Things are possible on vacation that you would never actually do in the workaday world. Right? Or <clears throat> it may be that you are one cranky son of a bitch. And at the office, there is no way you're going to allow somebody to lord things over you. And it just really grinds you when people tell you what to do, especially when they don't explain. You know how that happens, you know? I'm the boss. Do this. Right? Seems foolish, seems inexplicable. you got to do it anyway. Right? Then Sunday rolls around. You go to church. There's somebody up there who you don't really know. <clears throat> Depending on the church you go to, they may have been chanting in a dead language for a while. They're wearing unusual costumes to mark them out as being different from you. Okay, They're interceding with you for God. All these things, and they're telling you what to do. Now, do you as a cranky, self-starting individual go, God damn it, I'm not going to take your word on this. I want to test this theology stuff. No, you believe it because it's acceptable within that context 
it's okay to be submissive to a higher authority. And then you go back to the office and you act just a different, different way. We believe things within context. If I wanted Bucky to shoot Nick, I would first condition Bucky to think that he was fucking James Bond. Okay, and it's 1968, and it's the heart of the Cold War. And Nick here is carrying the microfilm that has our secret defense plans. And because Bucky has been conditioned to think and act immediately in defense of our country, because I already established that A, that was his context, or B, I built that context, then when I tell him, oh my God, there's Nick right there. Bucky nailed the bastard. Okay, that can be done. That's the distinction. I can't make you do anything against your will, but I can make you do anything I want given sufficient time and condition. Okay, it's acceptable thinking. Now, selective thinking has to do with that hyperfocus that Tony was talking about, where the whole world drops away. I always talk to the subjects, <clears throat> I tell them before the trans experience starts, that outside sounds, outside disturbances can't disturb or distract them to the extent that they even notice them going even go deeper in trance until they just don't notice them anymore. I tell them that they will be aware of the sound of my voice without paying any attention to what it is that I'm saying. Is that possible? Yes. Ever flip on a stereo at home? Right? Turn out the tunes? Sounds pretty good. Then you walk into the next room for whatever reason. You can still hear the stereo but you're not paying attention to it the same way you were when you were standing in the same room or when you are sitting down and actively listening to it. You can still hear it, but you're not paying any attention to it at all. It's background sound. So I tell them, okay, that's what you're going to hear. Those are the acceptable and the um, best possible inputs for you. Right? And then we go ahead and roll through the session because then I know that within the context, which is they want to be hypnotized, I will deal with permission in a minute, um, they want to be hypnotized, so that's the context. They expect to be hypnotized, and they fully believe that I'm a hypnotist. That helps with the context. Okay, and then we do this selective thinking, which narrows the entire universe down to the sound of my voice. Right? That's the only input they're going to be paying attention to. And they suspended critical thinking. As a first step, not too bad, right? Because anything beyond that point is accepted and act upon as though it were literally as real and as true as anything they'd ever physically experienced in their life. It's a very cool thing. So this is the definition we're going to work with. Now you'll notice in here it does not mention swinging watches, dangling crystals, mesmerizing gaze, okay? None of this stuff because the only thing that is necessary to establish hypnosis is to suspend judgments and then get them focused in on you. That's it. So, when you read well-meaning but poorly educated people talking about what hypnosis is and isn't, and they say something like a uh, given uh, therapeutic technique isn't hypnosis, but yet they're getting hypnotic phenomena back, well, it means that there's something wrong with their definition. Okay, any time, like one of the people said, uh, any influential uh, form of communication is hypnosis. That's very close, not entirely true. Any form of influential communication contains hypnosis or uses hypnosis. It's not hypnosis in and of itself, which is why I asked you the question when you're saying the use of language is hypnosis. Use of language is incredibly important because language are the symbol sets that we share together. Right? When I say chair, you don't necessarily know if I mean this chair or that chair or uh, the overstuffed chair at home, but you understand what chair means, and that's enough so that we can continue and move forward and have a shared understanding. Right? That's the purpose of language. It's a shorthand that saves you from having to go through all the physical experience. I can describe it to you, and you get it. Right? <clears throat> so, anytime I'm communicating, and I get a suspension of disbelief, and I get people's attention focused on me, it's hypnosis. Given that definition, what's been going on for the past 20 minutes? Hypnosis. Hypnosis is the basis of all learning.
you started learning math in grade school, they start out with things like, I have one block, and over here's another block. When I push them together, it's two blocks, okay? It starts small, okay? And you can physically verify it. But then they start talking about something like, well, <clears throat> they throw in a curve, you know? What happens when you add one ball and one block? <laughs> you know, we well, have two objects, but you only have one of each very advanced concept for preschoolers. <clears throat> but then you start getting into things like multiplication, okay? And if you want to say two times one, or two times three, even. That's pretty easy to get a physical manifestation right there on the teacher's desk so you can figure it out. But by the time it's like 17 times 34, you're operating on faith. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like there are not enough blocks necessary to teach higher math. And so what you do is it must be true. You've got an authority figure up there. You've got a lesson, which if you follow it, you're rewarded. And if you divert from it, depart from it, you're going to be punished, okay? And you're surrounded by people who think that 17 by 34 is going to yield a discrete answer each and every time. They all seem to believe it. It must be right. What happens anytime you say it must be right? The suspension of the critical factor. How the hell do you know whether it's right without actually doing it? Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so we use hypnosis as the basis of all learning because it's the way of getting the information in there unchallenged. So think about the classes. Yeah, Bucky. So like any time that we accept something from any authority just because that person is an authority, that would be like one of I'd call it hypnosis. Yeah. Because you gotta backtrack and say, well, what makes this person an authority? I mean, there's some people. For example, I know this guy, I can't say I know him, I've met him enough to say hi Carl Singles, hi Mark. Uh, uh, one of the top combat shooters of all time. Phenomenal man. And if he wants to talk to me about shooting, I'm gonna sit down and shut up and listen because he probably knows what he's talking about. But that's because I've also been places he's been, talked to people who know him, and you know, it's, it's been verified. Other people can stand up and talk, I might take it on faith. For example, a guy is a representative of Winchester manufacturers, okay, he's talking about rifles, okay, well, you might know what he's talking about, but if you come walking up, start talking about shooting, I don't know you from Adam, so I probably wouldn't accept it, okay, it has to do with how you derive the whole thing of authority, if authority comes from position as opposed to performance, then it's probably what you accept after that point is dependent on hypnosis, okay. Right. Would you say that when you assume something as a mental shortcut, that that is a kind of suspension of the critical factor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's a great way to discover how, what's true without necessarily going out and having the experience itself. Okay. It's any form of mental rehearsal involves assumptions, right? You're constructing the entire environment, the entire scenario, and you're running it through. And so long as you keep an objective self, then yeah, that, that's absolutely true. If you're not staying objective, then you're going over into faith. And while that's hypnosis, we normally categorize it as bad hypnosis. If, I'm, if I touch on any of your hot buttons, please feel free to say, Mark's an asshole. Okay. It's not true, but it'll make you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by maintaining your objective self? Well, like if, you had, if you're visualizing, you know, you're rehearsing something. If you are rehearsing it as a tool, trying on new thoughts, new behaviors, new beliefs, to see what it's like, to actually have the experience before you make up your mind, then that's a good thing, okay? If, however, you are going off into a construct, something you're dreaming it up, and you literally treat it as though it's concrete reality, then that's delusion, okay? Make sense? Yeah. Totally. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of it, you, some of you may have heard me in different forums talking about how it's, it's kind of a bad thing to set up power figures or symbols outside yourself. Like I know some guys who are really into comic books, okay, and they, <laughs> they go ahead and they build these constructs about superpowers and it's essentially a mechanism of putting power outside yourself. 
you know, because why would you have to have a tingling spider sense or a magic uh, implement or something like this in order to do a phenomenal thing? Aren't you capable of doing that anyway? You're human, right? Each one of you is capable of doing or experiencing anything that any human being can do within certain limitations. But the certain limitations are like, you know, I know a guy who was one of like the last polio cases in the United States. His legs are fucked up. Now, if he decides he wants to go beat Ben Johnson in a 100-yard sprint, okay, that's not going to work. But if he wants to do anything else, it's all available to you. There's no such thing as a personality type, certainly not a personality type that limits you. There, there's no such thing as poor memory. There, there, there's no such thing, really, as uh, some of the more advanced behavior patterns like dyslexia, okay? Because while it can, it can exist, it can manifest, it's a learned behavior. It's not like people are wired that way. There are very, very few things that we're wired to do wrong. They're, they're discovering that some forms of schizophrenia, for example, are purely chemical, and so that's not your fault. You know, but the list of those things is relatively short. The list of things that you do have under your control is huge. It's enormous. It encumbers the entire range of human behavior, which is another reason why you ought to be learning hypnosis. If it's the basis of all learning, and if it's true, as Freud said, that hypnosis is the shortcut, you don't have to go through all this crap of you know, direct experience and pain involved learning and all that kind of crap. If you can just do it through hypnosis, you know, you're probably all learning how to do it. Okay. Great. Must be doing hypnosis. Everybody's in that nice zony state right now. So you could work with someone with uh, like uh, who has been diagnosed anyway with like ADHD. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know people who have made themselves millionaires giving hypnotic ritalin to kids. Okay, because most of these kids who have ADHD. Okay, and they keep adding to it. Did you know that this, the year that they added, uh, it used to be ADD, okay? Right, yeah. when, when, they did, when they added attention deficit disorder to the official diagnostic manual, the diagnostic rate went up 600% that year. Why? Because you can charge for it and you can sell drugs for it now, okay? These are hyperactive kids who have difficulty maintaining focus. Typically, they're very bright kids. And so if you work with them on mechanisms about how can you learn more quickly so that their learning rate actually matches the theoretical or their capacity rate, and if you get them, teach them how to focus, and then I always teach these kids how to daydream vividly without showing any external sign, okay? So <laughs> when they're sitting in class, instead of jumping and, you know, having their name on this, they can go be a PT boat captain until the teacher catches up, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you can treat things like that. Anything that looks like a learned behavior, and how do you find out if it's a learned behavior? Can you train them out of it? If you can train them out of it, it's not genetic. Right? So can you train someone out of schizophrenia and the things that are commonly thought of Some. as being chemically based? Some. Some. Yeah, sometimes it's schizophrenia. It involves, and this is, remember I told you just a few minutes ago about how therapy can be very dangerous to the therapist. It's, it's harmless to the subject, okay? The way that you work with schizophrenics is you first enter into their world. Ever hear this before, right? You must enter into their world and then guide them back out. I read a, a story by a band player where he said that a guy who was hearing voices come out of the outlets and so he put a speaker box behind sure. it and didn't have necessarily through the speaker. It's an advanced form of pacing. Yeah. yeah, right. So you believe it? Well, he did another thing, his famous example with the snakes, where there's a schizophrenic who saw snakes everywhere. So he said, okay. And he was working in the hospital and said, you know, do I have permission to talk to your, your schizoid? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So he goes in there, he's wearing a white lab coat, he's carrying a clipboard, he's got a medical bag, inside of which he's got a bunch of snakes that he borrowed from a pet shop. Okay. <laughs> and he opens up uh, the bag and uh, pulls out some you know, literature or something, he starts taking notes, he goes, oh, so you're schizophrenic, you know, how long have you been uh, diagnosed since he's taking notes? In the meantime, these snakes start to crawl out of the fucking bag. You know? <clears throat> and so the patient goes, uh, uh, Dr. Baylor, there are snakes. 
He goes, yeah, I see that. It says here, you see snakes. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 no. These are real snakes. He goes, well, how can you tell the difference? And the patient goes, well, the imaginary snakes ha have these different colored bands on them. The imaginary snakes do? Right? Metal patients aren't stupid. They're just crazy. Right? You know? So when you enter into their world, start working within their logic, and start showing internal inherent contradictions, pose a threat within that world as opposed to it's okay out here with the rest of us, okay, they can pop around. Yeah. Yeah. Other things, like I say, chemical imbalances, there are some people who believe that using hypnosis you can condition people to so profoundly control their physiology that you can, you can actually correct those types of imbalances. <clears throat> I don't know if that's true or not. A lot of it has to do with individual skill on the therapist side, it has to do with the individual receptivity on the subject side, and it has to do with very lengthy conditioning. I can tell you I've seen cases, I've seen, literally talked to people who had advanced cancers put into remission or are completely gone. Um, all kinds of miracle cures that have come through controlling their mental states. But it would be both foolish and illegal for me to start saying that, oh yeah, you can, you can go do these medical cures using only hypnosis. If that makes sense. Okay. Coolness. So there you are, it's the basis of all learning. And it's astonishingly easy to get. Think about when you've had a class, okay? I mean, you've all been to school at one level or another, and you've all had teachers who were like really, really great teachers. But when you're in the range of that person's voice, within the range of their influence, what is it that you're feeling while they're working? Think back. Ever have a professor who was just like really compelling, really fascinating? What is it that you were feeling while they were teaching? Anybody? Inspiration. Like this totally relaxing sound about that. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that, right? Yeah. Laughing. Laughing, getting into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Laughter is an interesting emotion. It's a universal emotion. You can feel it attached to almost any state. Okay? <clears throat> Ever been around an accident? You'll find people laughing as a stress relief. Okay? Ever hear the phrase nervous laughter? Okay? And of course there's like there's belly laughs and guffaws and chuckles and giggles and all that kind of stuff. There's also black humor. Okay? Like going to a funeral of a friend and turning to your buddy and saying, well he's dead but he looks good. You know? <laughs> And you laugh, okay? Emotion is a, er, laughter is a universal emotion. You can find it almost anywhere. Which is why if you can get someone to laugh, you can shift them to any state. So we'll, we'll, we'll be dealing with that later, okay? But the point is, when you're in that learning situation, chances are you feel that you're, you, well, you match the definition of hypnosis. That's why I don't include things like inductions as being necessary. Induction is a technical name for taking the person into a hypnotic state. But most of what is known as inductions um, are really rituals. They're sort of entertainment. They reassure both the client and the hypnotist that hypnosis is taking place. Okay, for example, <clears throat> um, hang on a second, I gotta retrieve something out of my bag. A prop. Think quietly amongst yourselves. <laughs> Now, <laughs> well, this is cool. I can be back here, and I'm still coming from up there. <laughs> How far does this thing have range? How far down the hall can I go? Probably pretty far. Pretty far. You know, I got myself in terrible trouble one time because I was working with a excellent microphone, and I went walking into the men's room, and <clears throat> I'm leaving that puppy on. And broadcasting all the sounds coming out of the men's room <coughs> back into the seminar room. That's, that's on one of our uh, now unpublished products. Okay. This is a prop. It's a crystal. Okay. Now, when I'm using this, it's a heart-shaped Austrian crystal, 
And it's got the, the way it's cut, it actually has an inverted five pointed star inside. So for people who are into magic, I can go into all kinds of symbolism that way. Okay? Or for people who don't know or don't care about magic. And so how interesting it is to try to find the center of this piece. Okay? And then we just go ahead and have them and just watch it and gaze and you fix and give them all the suggestions about staring, project your mind into the crystal and you're doing all kinds of crap like that. Now, why does this work as a hypnotic induction? What possible connection is there between doing something like having to stare at this crystal, find the center, meditate on the symbolism, <clears throat> and going into this state of suspended judgment and selected focus? Well, we cheat. <laughs> as trained hypnotists, I expect you to cheat at every opportunity. Okay? <clears throat> because You can use the subject's physiology as your ally. When you're doing inductions, you can do something called eye fascination. You're staring so fixedly at that object, the whole world narrows down to this object, the magic hypnosis crystal. Yes. Okay, but if you were to do this instead, you all have an induction device attached to the end of your hand. Okay, it's called a finger. I want you to just stare at one of your fingers, and by stare I mean do not blink. Stare fixedly at that finger. Maintain your focus so that with each and every breath, it seems like it narrows down and you just stare and stare. And I want you to notice how quickly you can discover that your eyelids begin to feel heavy. Heavy heavier and heavier, and you feel the inclination and the desire to let them close all the way down. All the way down. And as they close all the way down, you feel a sense of relaxation beginning to seep all throughout your body. Now, go ahead. Take a deep breath. Open your eyes. Come all the way back up. <clears throat> Why did that work? If you stare at anything, if you stared at Pamela Anderson without blinking, you have this tremendous urge to close your eyes. Your corneas are drying out. Okay? It's physiological. Right? You have this tremendous urge to close your eyes. And the hypnotist is telling you you're going to feel this urge to close your eyes. Oh my god, it must be hypnosis. Okay? No, you just want to close your fucking eyes. That's all it is. But because there's suspended judgment, remember, no critical thinking. If I say it must be hypnosis, I mean shit, I get paid to do these things. I must know what I'm talking about. It must be hypnosis. So eye fascination works staring at candles. Candle magic, anybody? Yes? As far as like something that's going to happen, is that the kind of same thing like, like the floating hand, how it's like, yeah. the hand is going to go up? Mm -hmm. Right, you're setting presuppositions. Presuppositions are things that have to be true. Okay. <clears throat> Another good thing is the hand clasp test. You can't take notes on this. I'll take your hands, clasp them together, and squeeze them down so hard. See my fingers, see how they turn in weird colors? Okay. Squeeze that hard. What you do is you pick a knuckle and you stare at it. Okay? Squeeze harder, harder, harder. Squeeze them tighter, tighter, tighter. Like a solid block of wood. Maybe a block of stone. Just lock down, lock down tight. Harder, harder, harder. Squeeze, squeeze. Gonna be a man. Squeeze them all the way down. Right, sort of. Now, now, notice that even if you were to try to take them apart, you couldn't because they're squeezed down and locked so hard that you can't possibly pull them apart without just letting go of the state entirely. Now, normally, okay, let go, gently let go. Okay. Normally what happens with that kind of induction is there's two things going on. First of all, three things. Another caveat. I do this all the damn time. I say there's two things and I immediately think of a third. So you can just assume that if I say two things, there's going to be more than that. Okay. Eye fascination. Pick a knuckle and look at it. Right? Stare at it. Then you are squeezing harder, 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 continually squeezing tighter down. And you notice your muscles start getting kind of weird. There's something called muscle rictus. What that means is that when you've got them locked down so tight for such a period of time, it actually takes more effort to release them than to maintain that locked state. Okay, but if I'm telling them that this is taking you into hypnosis, physiology will once again 
come to my aid and convince you that you can't pull them apart. Now, you digital thinkers out there were going, well, of course I can pull them apart. And that's also true. You can pull them apart. That's what comes, but we're getting back to the suspension of the critical factor. Right? If you're not thinking about whether I can or can't, I'm just listening, I'm following instructions and going along, then you can't, you can't pull them apart. A variation on this is to do it like this. Hold them out like that and to press out. Do this, press out as far as you can. Okay, now, say you're, pre you see, you're taking those fingers and you're literally push out the fingers, they're locked together, literally. So now we're talking about you know, push out, oh, push them harder, 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 until they become so tight, so locked, they're like a solid block, and you find that just staring at them in the hood that you can't pull them apart. You push them, push them apart, you get to the point where you can't possibly pull them apart. And as you notice that the power of your mind is locked them together like a solid block of stone, blah, 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 then you convert it into hypnosis. Why does this work? Your fingers don't bend that way, right? <laughs> so you push them up against an immovable stop and say, now, try and pull them apart. You can't until you, unless you bring your arms back together and release that lock. Again, it's you're using physiology, using a ritual to convince the client that they're going into hypnosis. Okay, other things? Other things you can use are things like shock. Okay. You ever had a real bad scare? Anybody? Okay. Now, when you had this real bad scare, what was the quality of your thought process? Yeah, right. Everything stopped. He said you don't want to be scared anymore. That's all you're focused on. I just don't want this to be happening anymore. The quality of your thought process goes down. It's more like taking something on an Einstein level and reducing it to a cage full of gibbering monkeys, you know? Until the threat is removed or it's successfully identified and categorized, then what happens is no further um, input or any further thought gets processed. Nothing happens until the interruption is serviced and resolved. So shock can be very, very good form of hypnotic induction. Anybody who takes a stage class learns a shock induction. That's where you can take somebody into trance in a second. Just walk up and bam, you got them. Okay? On the other end of the scale, boredom works wonderfully well. Okay? <clears throat> Somebody is droning on at the front of the room. Okay? And you'll notice that the percentage change in this year's revenue figures from the previous three years of adjusted revenue figures is minuscule compared to the allocated information, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and you're sitting back there. You, you've, you've passed brain death, you know, some time ago. And now you're back to thinking about Pamela Anderson or your favorite vacation or whatever. You're fantasizing, you have gone into a trance state because you were bored into it. You escaped into a trance state. Okay? It used to be thought that the hypnotic monotone was the best way to hypnotize people. You know what the hypnotic monotone is? It's pretty much self-explanatory. You can imagine yourself getting very sleepy. You will now begin to get sleepy. As you listen to the sound of my voice, your eyelids will become heavier and heavier, and you will go into hypnosis. In the 50s, this was the accepted way of doing hypnosis. There's still guys out there doing this. Still making money doing this. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's like these desperate clients go, get me the fuck out of here, and they escape in the trance. You go into trance because the conscious mind will not pay attention to something that is boring it to death. Well, when the conscious mind checks out, the only thing that's left is the subconscious, and that's where all the trance states take place. Are there different degrees to which your conscious mind can check out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like and it comes and goes. Yeah. yeah, it's a very dynamic process. People ask me all the time, say, well, how do you know you got somebody down in trance and you, you know, they're going to stay there? It's easy to test for where they are in trance at that particular moment. It's pretty hard to determine what's going to happen. I mean, they may have had chili dogs with onions right before they came in to do the session, which means no matter how willing they are, no matter how good I am, there's this gas production going on, right? You know, so, so anything can pop them back out of trance. It's your job to pay attention and catch it. 
take them back down to the level where they need to be. So yeah, conscious mind comes and goes. I mean, this, people are always telling me, they, say, they learn about some of the advanced projects I do on conditioning, for example, which is another popular topic these days. Conditioning is the process of replacing stimulus response mechanisms at the precognitive level. All that means is the stuff you do without thinking about it. Training is very different. Training involves the acquiescence and the cooperation of the conscious mind. So training can include conditioning. Conditioning never includes training. That makes sense? Somewhat. Okay. Well, as you experience it, it'll, it'll make more sense to you. Um, how do we get into that? All I think was chili dogs. I know that wasn't it. I was just asking if the critical mind was like an on-off thing. Oh, was yeah. Thing. So people tell me, they say, well, isn't there this tremendous danger where you're conditioning to take the conscious mind and just get it the fuck out of there? I mean, like, shut it off, switch it off, destroy it. You know, oh, my God. No. The greatest minds in religion and philosophy, the arts, have been trying for all recorded human history to get rid of the conscious mind, to get rid of that sense of ego. And that fucker is indestructible. I mean, everything that has been tried, lifelong meditation, advanced esoteric pro, uh, you know, techniques, massive infusions of psychotropic drugs, at the end, like the smoke clears, the rubble's lying there, and conscious mind pops back, you know, hey, that was interesting, you know? You, you, you can't get rid of it. It will always be coming back in because it's got a very important thing to do. You, the entire front third of your brain is designed to feed and support the conscious mind. That's all it does. Okay, so the fact that it's going to be there, you may as well make friends with the far more powerful part, which is the subconscious, because the conscious only knows what the subconscious allows it to know. Right? I like to go, it's just like doing sales, you know? Would you rather pitch to the assistant junior manager or you want to talk to the guy who writes the fucking check? Right? So the conscious mind will always be there. It'll come and go, but it will only be a distraction or impediment to the extent that the subject is conditioned to believe it will be. If they understand that it can come and go, it's like I tell people, something might happen during the course of this session. It could be something important, like the fire alarm, in which case you would emerge from transit instantly, knowing exactly what to do. And that's the truth, okay? You can have a subject as deep in the trance as you could possibly get them, and they're still going to beat you out the office door if there's a fire alarm going. Why? Because they're the only one in the room that actually has full control of their faculties at that point in time. I'm wide awake. I still got the kind of mind fucking me up, you know? So they pop right up. There's never any danger. But there could be other things something that has significance to them. For example, I was working with a client one time, I was talking about being lost and dreaming in the clouds. Boom, it popped right out. Turns out someone in their family had been in an airline, airplane accident, killed, okay? Clouds were not a good imagery, okay? So the conscious mind came in, said, no, wait a minute, we're not gonna do this anymore. Okay, so we just worked around that, found, you know, we went to the beach instead. Um, but the conscious mind will always be there, will always step in. But you can give it something to do, or you can provide the subconscious mind a mechanism to safely shut off the conscious mind. And I'll give you language for that. I hate giving language, but this, is, this particular one is important because it's, it's tremendously useful to just get the conscious mind out of the way. Okay? So, <clears throat> another thing you can do to induce trance, or rhythm. Okay. Ever been to uh, Indian powwow? You know the constant throbbing drums. Why do they do that? It's cheaper than drugs. Okay. It puts everybody into an altered state. Do you, do you know what I mean when I say altered state? <coughs> okay. New rule. If I ask a question, you must respond. Okay. Yes. Sure. Yes. Jesus. All right, let's try it again. If I ask a question, you must respond. Okay? Okay. Hey, okay. <laughs> Three tries of charm. Okay. If I'm doing hypnosis, like working with somebody, do not respond. Okay? Well, you can join in the trance and, you know, have a great time, but that's not the time to be asking questions or comments. That's all I'm saying. Because whenever you're deliberately doing trance work, openly doing trance work, it works best if there's only one hypnotist at a time. Right? <clears throat> okay. I, I've done... I've been doing this long enough. I've run across every possible screw up. I've been doing demonstrations before. I have somebody who's like responding beautifully. I'm excited because I'm going, oh, cool, the demo's going well. You know, and I'm quite the class is excited. And then somebody back in the room will go, 
That's fucked up. <laughs> okay. Now, I get irritated. The subject gets scared. Because what was it? It's a direct suggestion. That, non-specific, must mean everything that's going on is fucked up. Oh, my God. You know, evil hypnotist. Thank you very much. Yeah. In the clinical work, we, we always joke about how if you come in and you don't actually have any problems, we'll give you one so we've got something to work with. You know, But in class, we don't really want to go that far. Okay. But rhythm, drum circles, okay, music. I'll be playing music as we go along through the weekend. Let's trance music. Because what it is, is there's something called the frequency following effect. Now, the frequency following effect is just an aspect of your physiology that means that you tend to synchronize your brain waves in a rhythmic external source. And you've experienced this before, too, right? Ever go out to a late night club? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your memory works, everybody else is fucked up. <clears throat> okay, yes, you went out to a late night club. You go out there, it's in the middle of the night. You push through the doors, what happens? Throbbing music, flashing lights. Why? It's the middle of the freaking night. You're drinking alcohol. I mean, they don't want their patrons lying under the tables, not buying anything, right? They want to pump up your energy state, and so they give you this highly invasive, constant rhythmic stimulation because the frequency following effect pulls your brain waves up to a very active state. Next thing you know, even though you've already had uh, three zombies here out there shaking the booty on the dance floor, okay? Thinking it's a great thing. But how about this? How many of you have ever been in front of some type of wood burning fire? Campfire, fireplace? Yeah, okay. You know how you can light the fire, flames are leaping up, and you don't feel that much different. But just a little while, as the wood starts to burn down, how do you start to feel? Pretty damn relaxed, right? It's because you've got the glowing red coals. You've got that slow, flickering light. Now, as you're sitting there, and usually it's in the dark, <coughs> you're sitting there, you've got the slow flicker of the light, your brain waves start to slow down to match that slow flicker. Your brain waves adjust to match any rhythmic external source. So slow flicker slows down. As your brain waves slow down, you become physically relaxed and you slip into a state called somnambulism. Somnambulism is the mental state of being right on the threshold of sleep where your body can literally go to sleep while your mind is, it's still awake, but is dreamy and drowsy, completely open to suggestion. <coughs> it corresponds to what we call a theta state in hypnosis, and it's kind of the holy grail for hypnotists, because while you're in that somnambulistic state, whatever is said or done, so long as it doesn't violate your basic principles, will in fact be accepted as being utterly, perfectly, true. Now, how often have you heard the romantic advice, get her in front of a fireplace, right? Nice romantic evening at home. Why? Because it's going to trance her right up. As so long as you stay somewhat awake, you can just leave her and say, honey, I have a few suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> you know that irritating mother of yours? Gone. <laughs> no, that's a bad thing. Okay, your question? Um, so you said some animals with the same as yeah, yeah. Theta is refers to the level of brain waves. Okay, and somnambulism refers to the state that results. Okay, we like somnambulism. That's where we want everyone to be. Yes. I don't want to get into a big technical discussion about what actually is happening, but when you're mm -hmm. talking about brain waves, is that like a theory or the actual? I mean, how do you? What is that? Your 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 mind is a electrochemical device. It's an organic device, but it's emitting electrical signals. <coughs> it does so at certain rhythms, depending on what it is you're doing. In fact, yeah, I mean, if you, if you ever watch the Discovery Channel, I do, because they're always putting on cool shit. Um, they'll do things like they'll do uh, these uh, scans of brain activity. And they'll have you do math. You can see one, one part light up, and they'll have you remember something. when a different part lights up, and they'll play some music while you're doing math. And it's like, you know, the whole thing lights up. <coughs> well, these things can be measured. Okay, and in fact, Tony was talking about a mind machine earlier. Um, 
that my machine is a pacing device that uses the frequency following effect to take you into a trance state. You don't have a choice. I, mean, I love introducing people to mind machines, especially trained, experienced hypnotists. Because trained, experienced hypnotists are by far the hardest people to get into trance. Partly because we have so little practice, we're always doing other people. And part of it is, we're all technique junkies. Okay? And if Bill was going to start working with me up here, I would, I would want to go into trance because A, it's relaxing as all hell, and B, it helps him do the demo. Okay? I get the benefit. But there's another part of me going, Oh shit, that was really cool. Okay, because he said something, he did something, so I always watch you for that. So we take the trained hypnotist, we put him on a mind machine, say go ahead and resist. As hard as you can, as best you can, as long as you can. Okay? Nobody makes it past two, three minutes. But we all go into trance. Because the frequency following effect does not rely on your belief system, it relies on your physiology. So if you're human and you've got a pulse, you're gonna go into trance with one of these things. Okay? And it doesn't matter if you say, well, I'm photoepileptic. And I go, well, congratulations. Don't use the glasses. You know, just use the earphone and get, get a regular pulse of the sound instead. Now, it can be measured and it can be manipulated. That's why, um, actually, you guys might be interested in this. I know a guy out here in California who consults with churches. <clears throat> and what he consults with is how to increase the offerings. Right? Because churches are cash businesses. Right? <clears throat> Get used to it. <clears throat> Clarity is going to happen all weekend long, whether you want it or not. So, he goes out and he goes in and he analyzes the lighting and the sound within the church. He doesn't mess around with the content of what they're talking about or putting them through special classes to change your attitudes. Fuck that. He works with the sound and the light. Because he knows that by adjusting the sound and the way the light plays upon the crowd, you can increase the trance effect. And his standard guarantee is, if you don't double the offering, don't pay me. Okay? And he's a wealthy man. Right? Because you can rely on this. You know it's going to happen. So yeah, it's easily it's measurable. It's uh, capable of being manipulated. And it's easily attained. We consider it a good thing. When I'm using it. <laughs> Actually, I know a hypnotist down here, another guy out here, he lives in uh, Malibu, and he does all kinds of experiments. Um, and he gives seminars, and he'll, he'll get, uh, he does metaphysical seminars, so he gets, he gets large, touchy feely kinds of crowd. So he thought that he would experiment with, he does music all the time. He's one of these monotone hypnotists, by the way. I mean, his personal style is not all that terrific. But he's also a self made millionaire many times over with this stuff, so I listen to what he has to say. He always plays trance music while he's working. He plays trance music even when, like while I'm talking to you now. He'd be playing trance music in the background so that everyone is safely gone. <clears throat> but then he thought he was going to start experimenting with light as well. So, being a clever hypnotist, he went way too far and put these big banks of lights behind him facing the crowd. <clears throat> and as he started to do his induction, he had these lights pulsing. First at an alpha rhythm, which is where you are right now, wide awake, alert, refreshed, fascinated, right? And then they slow down to take the entire room down into somnambulism. And he's thinking, this is pretty fucking cool. Okay, so he's reading along. But in his peripheral vision, there are these windows at the back of the room. Well, plate glass not only allows you to see through, it also reflects. <laughs> okay, so he's getting these little pulses of light flashing back at him. <clears throat> and he said the only reason they figured out what actually happened was later on they realized they had this 30 minute blank spot in the audio tapes even though the video camera had been running the whole time so they look at the video camera and like the whole crowd goes into trance and the hypnotist just kind of keels over <laughs> and nothing happens for the next half hour because the lights just keep pulsing away you know? and then later on everyone wakes up relaxed refreshed alert <laughs> you know feeling fine convinced they must have learned something during that time and otherwise how else do you explain it? It's, it's very easy to take advantage of. You can also do it by things like if you're talking to somebody. Okay, I do this in classes, not this class. I would never do this to you. But if I'm teaching applications or if I'm just speaking for some reason, I'll stand up there and I'll just start doing my this. And I'm just talking away. I'm talking about examples. And at first I think it's kind of a nervous affectation. Okay, that's one beat per second that will take you into somnambulism all by itself. If it's just ticking away, because it's in the background. 
and I'm speaking this nice, soothing voice, and I'm talking about how easy it is to go into trance. Yeah, and pretty soon everybody's there. It's <clears throat> a general principle that will work every time, regardless of how you invoke it. Uh, through the machines, like I was talking about with Tony, doing this, or even just speaking in a certain tempo. Okay? Now, my teaching voice is remarkably similar to my trance voice, and that's deliberate. It's because I don't want to remember what my teaching voice is, my trance voice is. I don't want to mark out when hypnosis starts and ends, because by my definition, you really can't do that. You know, I mean, if you're a human, you've got a pulse, and I'm in the room, hypnosis is going to take place, because that's just how I structure all my communications. It works so much better. I want you to learn, so I do it. Yeah. My business partner is a psychologist, and having learned these techniques, I walked into his office and it's a trap. The whole office is a trap. He's, mm -hmm. got, a, he's got a clock that ticks at one second, mm -hmm. uh, tick, and, and it's loud enough that you hear it until you're in conversation. Mm -hmm. And I put it out to him, and he goes, yeah. <laughs> it's like saying your car has wheels. <laughs> That's the way it works. <laughs> That's pretty fine. Yes, sir, Bucky. So as far as like music and death and trance, will that mean that? Like when you do like a concert or like a symphony, is that pretty much the audience is going to be like a symphony? Oh, yeah. He's asking, I don't know if you, if you guys heard that. He's saying if you go to the symphony, is that going to put you into trance? Yeah. Back when classical music was basically the mainstream entertainment, you had very radical composers doing things like Chopin, for example, one of my favorite examples. Um, he was Polish, okay, but <clears throat> while well, he was in France at the time, warfare broke out back in Poland, and he was a, a fierce patriot, so he wrote something called the Polonaise, which is a piece of classical music that literally started riots when it was being played because the people of the time, their context was they would go to these concerts expecting to be emotionally manipulated. Okay, then you have somebody like Bach in his slow, ponderous way was attempting to describe the, the beauty and symmetry of the universe. Because he's real big on numerology, he constructed his music a very particular way. But even today, turn on one of these soft rock stations. Okay, listen to the love songs. They're all in alpha rhythms. Why? In alpha rhythm, you can daydream very, very easily. Right? It, it's, it's, it's deliberate. Now, most composers, like pop composers, don't know squat about hypnosis, but they do know the rhythms that work for love songs. Right. Yeah, I, I read about that there were some opera singers that were forbid to perform in public because the vibrato they had mm -hmm. was such that it would induce a trance that actually caused the authorities to, yep. um, to panic about it. Mm -hmm. So they were, it, for them to sing in public was illegal. Pretty funny, huh? <laughs> yeah, cool stuff. Let's uh, go ahead and change it. The mind machine, on the other hand, are an entrainment device. They skip the learning process and instead take you directly to the state. Okay, so it just like it hauls you right down to that state. But you can choose. You can set these things. And we sell this model that has like 12 presets on it. So you have one that will take you into an alpha level for about a half an hour. And that's where we work on creative visualization, right? Because it takes you in a nice daydreaming state, and while you're there, you're still conscious, you're still self-directed. If you go into the theta state or somnambulism, you're no longer self-directed. It's kind of like launching somebody off. And if you don't give continual input, further stimulation, what's going to happen is they're just going to fall asleep or they'll emerge from trance all by themselves and no change will take place because it's all other directed. It relies on someone else, whether a live human being or a tape that you created for yourself or somebody created for you. I think it's pretty cool that your partner is so open to this. I mean, a lot of psychologists hate people like me because I work with rapid change and most psychologists don't. He said it was a great conversion for his clients. He was giving them that for 10 minutes and if he had something else to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write up my notes. <laughs> Here, go to Disneyland. With the glasses, what happens when it alternates the lights? What's the, what's the purpose of that? You've got a piece, you've got a bundle of mirror tissue called the corpus callosum. Okay, now the corpus callosum is about the size of your thumb, and it connects the right and front, or right and left frontal hemispheres. And that's what allows the communication between the different, oh God, 
There's a difference between the mind and the brain, okay? But mental activities, the mind tends to be focused in certain areas of the brain. So, for example, the, the part of the meat that you use to process logical linear thought tends to be the left hemisphere. <clears throat> Spontaneous, creative, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Intangibles tend to be processed on the right hemisphere. I say tend because if you have any damage to one hemisphere, the other one is to pick it up. But they communicate across the corpus callosum. Now, the interesting thing is, we talk a lot about uh, men and women and are there differences, what are the differences. There is one profound physiological difference between men and women. It's not the one you think. It's that women's corpus callosum is roughly twice as big as men's, right? Which is where all this intuitive stuff you get from women comes from. They're already wired correctly. Men have to learn how to open that up. And so what happens is when you have those lights flickering back and forth, what you're doing is you're giving a signal to the left eye that has to be processed by the right hemisphere. It means traffic has to cross the corpus callosum, same the other way. And by constantly flickering back and forth, you're basically conditioning the mind to be sending signals back and forth, back and forth, which later on, when you, you want to open up your intuition so you're actually having it while you're wide awake and it's useful, you know, you have, you have a greater tendency for that to be able to take place. So using this would actually, you don't need to do something like graph. I don't recommend drug-based approaches because A, it puts all the power in the drug. Right? I mean, anyone who tells you they take paracetam for the bursts of creativity is basically confessing that they work better with the drug than without it. And that's a belief. It's not a reality. But if you believe it long enough, it, be, it becomes that. Second thing is paracetam was designed for a very specific purpose. It's designed for working with severely damaged individuals, like Alzheimer's patients. Okay? And so to use a drug at that particular potency just because it happens to be legal I think is somewhat questionable. I like, I belong to the school of I want all my tools with me all the time because I never know when I'm going to need them. Right? I mean, anytime I've had an accident, it wasn't planned. Right? That's why they call them accidents. So as things come up in my life, I never know when I need to be more intuitive, more creative. I do know that there are times when I will need to have access to more than my usual capacity or capability. And I better have some way of doing that. Okay? If I'm in a bind, even if it's just working on a deadline, you can't really just tell the world, hold it a minute, I want to take this pill, it's going to take about 30 to 45 minutes to kick in, and then we can perceive the reality. You know? So I don't I don't approve of that. I think that I mean I don't even like to take aspirin. Okay? I'd rather work with pain control with what I've got, which is mental control over how I perceive things. One of the things we commonly teach people with hypnosis is pain management. That is, I mean, we get people coming in with chronic pain. Doctors hate patients with chronic pain. Why? They've got no good response. All they can do is drug the hell out of you and hope it goes away sometime. We teach them to take that sensation of pain and transmute it, morph it, into something else, like pressure or heat. So when you feel the pain, you instead feel a sense of pressure, like something is like grabbing a hold of you or it's a little bit hotter there, <clears throat> so that you know it's occurring. You never want to take pain away. That doesn't make any sense. The reason you're feeling pain is something is terribly wrong. If you don't feel that pain, you're going to overextend yourself. Okay? It's like I did this emergency thing one time, and it wasn't planned, it wasn't riding with the paramedics. We were actually out backpacking. And we were way the hell too far in the wilderness on the John Muir Trail. <clears throat> and a buddy of mine seriously, seriously injured his ankle. And we tried the usual approaches and it was still just too much to him. And we needed to get out or else he or all of us were going to die. Okay, it's kind of what happens when you go backpacking in the wilderness. It's a crapshoot. So, <clears throat> I basically take, took his pain away. It was with his knowledge and permission because he had to walk on an injured ankle for about 40 miles until we'd get to a point where we could actually call for help. You know. And so, messed him up, put him in a worse shape, but he survived. So sometimes you might want to do that. Or another famous example is uh, <clears throat> one of the guys that I've trained with is a guy named um, Gerald Kine. He's down in Florida. Brilliant hypnotist. Forgotten more about hypnosis than most of us will ever learn. He's worked as a student with some of the pioneers of modern hypnosis. Tremendously natural man. Also a real wild man. 
genuine wild man. <coughs> and uh, he used to do things. He used to go riding with the paramedics down in uh, Dade County, you know, uh, Florida. And they arrived. This particular incident was they arrived at the scene of a horrible, brutal car crash, and the guy is trapped in the wreckage, screaming. Firemen are trying desperately with the jaws of life to like uncrinkle all this wreckage so they can get him out before he dies because his leg is being crushed and he's bleeding. It's horrible. So <laughs> Jerry gets out of the paramedic wagon, comes walking up to this guy, guy's screaming his head off, you know, surrounded by flashing lines, chaos on. Bob <clears throat> said, Hi, I'm Jerry Kine. I'm a hypnotist. Wanna feel better? <laughs> she guy's like, <laughs> you know, forgets to scream, what the fuck, you know, am I in hell? You know, what, what is this? Jerry does an instant induction on him, slams him down in a trance, completely removes the sensation of pain. So while the paramedics actually ended up amputating this guy's leg to get him out of there to the hospital in order time to save him, the guy's carrying on a conversation with Jerry in a conversational voice about his wife and kids, what he does for a living, because he doesn't feel any pain. He didn't feel he was totally numb? No, because see, Pain is something that you experience through a filter. There's only one sense you have that's unfiltered. That's the sense of smell. Anybody know why? Why is your nose right above your mouth? To keep you from putting rotten food in it, right? It's the only sense you have that is not filtered. It's hardwired. It goes straight to the brain with no change. Everything else is filtered through perception, right? You do not actually see what's occurring for two reasons. One is perceptual filter. I mean, you look at this and you go, this is green, right? Okay. You know what actually happens? Do you know how optics work? Okay. You aren't seeing green. This is something that absorbs green. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. It's like through the mirror into wonderland. You don't actually see what's happening because there is a time lag. There's a processing lag between me going blah and you going, what the fuck is he doing? Okay? <clears throat> it's because the signal comes in, you interpret it, and then you respond to your interpretation of it. Time takes place. In the meantime, reality has already changed. Right? It's the same with all your senses. Pain is very easy to take away because it's not real. It's a generated result based on some kind of input, right? It doesn't correspond to physical reality at all. Phantom pain. You can feel pain from something that's not injured. You can feel pain from a limb that's not even there anymore. One of the big uh, surprises in store for amputees is that the, you know, the limb that was cut off still hurts. <clears throat> Why? Because you continue to generate this response. How about hallucinations? Okay, if what you see is literally real, how do you explain hallucinations? Positive hallucinations, like uh, Pamela Anderson, and I'll, she was <laughs> pick on her today. You know, Pamela Anderson walks in the door, I can teach you how to hallucinate that, doesn't mean it's real. Or, I could condition you to the fact that Pamela Anderson doesn't exist, and then have her walk in here and do whatever it is Pamela Anderson does, and you wouldn't even see it. How is that possible unless it's a construct? It's something that's a result of filtering and generation of meaning that is not tied to the underlying reality. It's fascinating stuff. But that's why, see, that's why things like pain management work, is because you're just fooling around with the interpretive mechanism. You're saying, take that input, change it to this, close the lid, you're done. Bucky. Um, but like, say you. Oh, we're all over the map right now. Right. We're doing it. Say, um, say you condition us to not see Pamela Anderson, but we wouldn't have to know that she is. So we... Sure, I'd have to pick a symbol you're already aware of. Okay. okay. An easier example of negative hallucination is you ever lose your car keys? Yeah. Now, when you found them again, were they actually in a place where you could reasonably expect to have found them? Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, I'll lose something that's actually sitting there. <laughs> right? And then, it's like, yeah, it's like the classic example is once you find it, then I start yelling, Cassie, why'd you move my keys? <laughs> That's the only explanation I can think of why I would find them right here. <clears throat> yeah. What actually, is, if, if, if you programmed us to not see Pamela Anderson and she walked in and we're looking right at her, I, I just don't understand how you wouldn't see her. 
you would generate something, say the background of the wall. You literally generate everything. I mean, you do that now. You generate everything that's necessary for this to seem real for you, right? Yeah. The universe appears to be happening from your point of view, right. right? Now, from my point of view, you got a walk-on part in my universe, yeah. But they're both true. Okay, you will generate anything necessary. It's like assumptions, right? Somebody says something to you, and you know what they must mean. Then you find out later it's not what they meant at all, right? Well, it was perfectly real to you at the time. You will generate whatever is required to convince you of the validity of your current thought, okay? But when you're in a state of non-critical thinking, that is, you're not making judgments. I tell you that you, you know, Pamela Anderson does not exist. You're okay, okay, and you stay within that state. It honestly doesn't matter. It sounds like an extreme example, okay? But she could be prancing around up here. She could be singing, dancing. It doesn't matter. You'd just be getting really irritated about why was everyone behaving so strangely? <laughs> because your senses would be telling you there's nothing here, right? <clears throat> Now, I, I talk about a famous Richard story. I like to tell Ben my story because I want to give him the full credit. He's done tremendous pioneering work on how hypnosis actually works. He calls it NLP, but what he does is hypnosis. Um, <clears throat> but he tells another great story about he was trying to teach this guy uh, negative hallucination. And the guy was just being this really being pretty stuck. You know, he's refusing to accept this could possibly exist. So Richard goes through the motions of, you know, allegedly putting him into transfer of induction, <clears throat> and he has on his desk this pen, okay? He says, now, when you open your eyes, you know, I'll snap my fingers, you'll open your eyes, and the pen will be gone. And then he picks up the pen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Is the pen gone? Yes, Richard, the pen is gone. Close your eyes! <laughs> you know, you put the pen back out there. Like, Negative hallucination. Because that's a convincer. There's a, there's a profound difference between belief and conviction. Right? You can believe that hypnosis exists. You can believe that it, people have tremendous powerful changes as a result of experiencing hypnosis. But you may not actually be convinced that you can do it or it work for you until you have some experience, direct experience, whether it's hallucinated or not, that is so convincing that from that point on, you no longer have to think about your belief, it's just your reality, which is why you, you, you pull tricks on people all the time as a professional. <laughs> Play with their mind, they pay you for it. <clears throat> they just didn't know what they were asking for, that's all. Right? So yeah, it's perfectly plausible. But it all begins with getting them into trance in the first place. <laughs> we'll wander back to the subject material here. <clears throat> getting them into trance using something as simple as eye fascination, a muscle rectus, shy board of rhythm. <clears throat> what else? Bill, what do you use? Well, there's a lot of things to use. Uh, well, you know, you can do an eye lock with them. I mean, you know, I can, I can actually dilate my pupils on command. These right. Days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's that's convinced right there because that's the you know hypnotic look. Um, yeah, just general vague terms. You know, speaking of nominalizations, mm -hmm. you know, then they have to go inside and start bringing up their own uh, ideas of what you're talking about. Do you know what nominalization is? It's a word that doesn't actually mean anything. You have to derive the meaning of it. So you go inside like and Hmm? Like Novelization, that's correct. Thank you very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can do things like um, distraction. Okay. <clears throat> we call these the uh, distract the baby approaches, where you have them focused on one thing while you're actually giving them rhythm or specific language content. <clears throat> so while they're paying attention over here, next thing they know, a half hour has gone by. <clears throat> Sensory overload. Okay. I'll do things like I'll tell a client who obviously can't be hypnotized or can't be hypnotized by someone else. I'd say, well, do you think you could be hypnotized? If you knew what to do, could you hypnotize yourself? Well, well yeah, I could probably do that because people who say that no one can hypnotize me think that they are the end all of all creation. So obviously they can do anything, so they can hypnotize themselves. So I say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tell you what to say. 
And as you repeat it back, then you can go into hypnosis that way. Can I give that a whirl? Sure. Okay. And then I start giving them a sequence of language. Language should be something like, go ahead and take a deep, deep breath. I'll say, go ahead and take a deep, deep breath. Feel a sense of relaxation starting down. Feel a sense of relaxation starting down. But as they're repeating it, I'm going to start to overlap it. So instead of having statements that go like this, nice and neat, I'll have it where they start to repeat after me. And by the time they get almost to the end, I'm going to start my second phrase. So I'm getting this overlap, getting overload. Now at the same time, I can be walking up. I'll do something like maybe I'll be touching their shoulder. Okay, maybe rubbing the neck, which is also rhythm. Okay, I'm also checking for muscle tension, which we'll get into when we start doing induction stuff, but it's more input. One more thing to keep track of. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to start filling up all his perceptual channels until it's got so clogged and he's behind that he loses track of where you are. When he loses track, that's it. You got it. They go all the way down now. You got it. So that's an overload technique. Okay? Or a variation on the overload technique is to get people really stressed out. Okay? When I have someone who is afraid of public speaking, if I run across somebody that's in a class, what's the first thing I do? Come on up here. <laughs> you know? Because they come walking up, and your point of view from the class is, you're, they're, they're people, but they're all focused this way. All right? And you come walking up, and you turn around, and now this is my reality. Everybody's fucking looking at you. I start to get tense. Okay, start to get nervous. And start thinking, oh, oh my God, what's going on in there? What are they looking at? What are they thinking? Am I going to be able to do this? There's all these thoughts going on while I'm also, you know, take a deep breath. <laughs> Boom. Stressed out people are by far the easiest to take in the trance because they're like that far away already. All you have to do is kind of like bump them over the edge in a kind and compassionate manner. <laughs> or like Bill says, leading. Okay? You go first. You may have heard this in other venues, right? Develop a sense of rapport so they're relaxed, they're paying attention, and then just go ahead and go into trance yourself. You're going to get dreamy. You're going to feel very relaxed. They pick that up. And they start to, because they're in rapport, they want to remain in rapport. And as you go into trance, they're looking at your blown out pupils. I always do hypnosis in a relatively darkened room. Okay, no overhead lights, only indirect lighting from a small lamp with like a 40 watt bulb. <clears throat> Why? Well, yeah, it is very resting, relaxful, and also means my pupils are going to blow out until there's like, you know, no color at all, right? Because these big black pupils that they're looking at, they're going, oh my God. They start to do that. You cannot dilate your pupils like that without interest and without relaxation, right? When you do it deliberately, you're pretty relaxed, right? You say so? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the control is focused. It's here. It's not tension all throughout the body. And so they'll follow you right in. So there are lots of different ways of getting into this. Okay. Sean? Um, there's a technique. I can't remember what it's called. Um, I, I'm assuming it's the... What my question is, is if it's the same as, as basically the, the way the overload thing works, uh, where you... Um, there's an example that Ron and I talk about all the time of... Uh, of uh, uh, where you say something like, uh, well, when you know you know, we have this thing about when, you know. Confusion. Confusion, right. Yes, confusion is, yeah, it's, it's very, very similar, if not a variation of overload. There are things you know. There are things you know. There are things you know you know. And there are things you don't know. You know you don't know them. And then there are things that you don't know, but you don't even know you don't know them. But when you take the things that you know you know, and you come up with the things that you know you ought to know, and you probably will know, and now you know. But those, that's where you take all that learning you bring it forward, and it just all makes sense to you, you know? <laughs> you know? They're, they're, they're four you knows back, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> you know? Yeah, now I'm going to be <clears throat> So, yeah, yeah, because they can't keep up. It's yeah. also a loss of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, Good one. Physically. Yeah. <laughs> It's so good to have students who have had me before, so I don't have to go to the syllabus. <laughs> Loss of equilibrium, <clears throat> mental or physical, okay? Which is why you'll see hypnotists, 
Here, Bucky, stand up here. Turn and face the crowd. Face the camera. You don't have a fear of public speaking, do you? Yes. Would you like one? Okay. <laughs> okay. You'll see hypnotists doing like this. Okay. We like to be very touchy-feely because I can tell right now. For example, right here, the muscles on his neck. Those are the first to tense up and the last to relax. So oftentimes, I'll go ahead and I'll put my hand right here. It's not a threatening gesture. Okay. I'm just doing this. Next squeeze, a little big, a little massage thing going. But I'm also establishing a rhythm. Right. Yeah. So I got the rhythm part going. Okay. But a loss of physical equilibrium would be something like, um, here, let's move you over here. I want you to stand right in front of the chair so you know the chair is behind you. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I want you to put your hands out like this. Okay. Now, I want you to just go ahead and focus right on, well, focus on that knuckle. Squeeze down hard. Focus, focus, focus. Ooh, okay, squeeze on tighter, harder, harder. You want to take harder, harder. That's right. Squeeze all the way down, all the way down. Because in just a moment, what's going to happen is you're going to be focused so tightly, squeezing so tight. What's going to happen? You're going to sleep all the way down, all the way down. Now, now. That's it. Now, just take all the time you need. Just one, two, three. Take the eyes open. Take a deep, deep breath. Feel good. There. Weird, huh? <coughs> Have a seat. When you're falling, it generates one of these interrupts that I was talking about before, okay, where you just, it's a shock, like, <clears throat> I'm off my equilibrium. You're not thinking about anything else at that point in time. And so whatever I say or do happens, goes straight in. Now, I put it in front of a chair because it's considered a poor form to have your subjects just keeling over, right? <clears throat> but it really wouldn't matter. For a few seconds, he would have dropped to the ground. He wouldn't have felt any pain. He just would have crumbled down to the ground. It's kind of hard to work with him down there. Okay, but you can do that loss of equilibrium in a lot of different ways. But that was a type of instant induction. There's another one where you actually jerk the person towards you while at the same time you're slamming their shoulder back. One of the most intrusive things I've ever seen in my life. It was taught to me by a guy who was six foot four with a heavy build. Okay, <clears throat> he's going, "This is simple. It's easy. Everybody ought to do it." I'm going, man, it's like you're terrifying him in the trance. You know, a guy six foot four with a heavy muscular build comes up, grabs you, jerks you forward, slams you back, and shouts sleep at the same time. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, he's got my gun hand. I, I have to escape in the trance. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, loss of equilibrium, but also the overload technique and the confusion relies on loss of mental equilibrium. You're mentally off balance. You can't keep up, you can't process everything. Or actually, you can, but your conscious mind can't. Right? All of these are designed to bypass, sidestep the conscious mind, to lull the conscious mind. Yeah? Another thing I've been playing with lately is uh, leveraging anchors. Mm -hmm. you know, you're actually asking the subconscious response when you get an anchor going. Mm -hmm. And then uh, keep going you know, through the anchoring process, you can you know, start to do uh, zip anchors. And you know what I'll do is I'll leave them with the words first, and then you know do the anchor demonstration. Mm -hmm. I notice how as I do this, this will happen. That feeling will increase, and I'll right. start leaving them that way. Right, right. And you're chaining all these convincers together because you explain it first. It tends to work, doesn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. A hypnotist explains what's going to happen. It tends to happen. 